If you've got your Bibles with you, I want to invite you, as always, to open those. Uh, I invite you, as always, to bring those, whether it's the old-fashioned paper version um, or a, uh, you have it on your phone, uh, but to follow along with God's Word, because I stop every now and then and point some things out, and I'm going to do that certainly today. And so this week, uh, Grandview Reads, part of Grandview Reads was uh, reading in the Gospel of Matthew, and I know it's like, well, we usually re- read this in December. Yeah, we do, maybe some years, but uh, it is part of the story. It's part of the story. In Luke's, in Luke's Gospel, interesting, you have the shepherds who were abiding in the fields nearby. We know that written on our hearts, right? And we know that the angel of the Lord showed up in a bright, blinding light, right? The presence of God showed up to those shepherds, the lowest of the low, those Jewish people, right? And they immediately went and saw Jesus. The light, uh, the presence of God led them to go into to the stable, if you will, and to worship Jesus. Matthew's gospel has the Gentiles showing up eventually, okay? So let me read this to you, and I'll stop several times as I read it, but um, <clears throat> we know about the Magi. They're not kings. They were scientists for that day. They were astronomers. They were smart people. They had a lot of wealth. And it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we've come to worship him. Verse 3, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. Now, put your finger right there and stop. Why? First of all, you've got to understand that factually, historically, King Herod was an evil man. He was a bad guy, okay? He, anything that he thought was going to threaten his power, he would kill those people, including his sons and one of his wives, okay? So Herod is disturbed to hear about this new king that may threaten his power. And it says, all Jerusalem with him. Why is Jerusalem upset? Because it's kind of like that folksy little sign that some of you have in your house, like in the Telford house. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? Is that right, Blaine? So it's if Herod isn't happy, nobody's happy. We're all upset because this is an evil man, and we don't know what he's going to do to us if he's unhappy. Okay, verse 4. When Herod called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they said, in Bethlehem in Judea, for this is what's written by the prophet, you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Out of you will come a ruler who will be my shepherd of my people Israel. So then Herod called the Magi secretly, and he found out from them the exact time the star had appeared, which was about 18 to 24 months previously, because the Magi lived a long ways away. It took him that long to get there. He found out when it had appeared, and then he sent them to Bethlehem and said to the Magi, Go and make a careful search for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. Lies. He's just lying. So after they had heard the king, the Magi went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star... They were overjoyed. And on coming into the house, they saw the child, Jesus, with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. When they opened their treasures, they presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. A couple of things about this. One, If you have one of those cute little nativity sets at your house, you get out in December and it's got the shepherds and the wise men all at once, you need to move the wise men out of there. They weren't at this stable. You with me? Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry to crash and burn that dream, but they showed up about two years later. Okay. They weren't at the stable. It says God's word. They were at a house. Okay. They were at a house. And maybe Joseph was out working and it says that Mary and Jesus was there. Okay. So the, the, the Magi got there late. And again, they weren't kings. Even though the hymn says we three kings of Orient are, they weren't kings. They were Magi. They were smart. They studied the sky. Second thing to remember, there might've been two, there might've been 200 Magi. Doesn't say. It only says that there were three gifts, right? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Just a little factual thing here. There's no thing that says there's three, but three fit into the nativity set. Are you with me? Right? 
<laughs> so just some factual information about that. The third most important thing, though, that I think is important to connect here is, I already told you part of it, is that in the big scheme of things, the Jewish shepherds got to Jesus first. I think that was part of what God thought was going to happen, is that the Jewish people would get there first and understand and embrace this, this uh, Messiah first. The Gentiles, as we know from reading Paul's words in, in the, the epistles, got there later, which kind of represents the Magi. But they got there. And the key thing I want to focus on is how they got to that destination. And it was the light. It was the light that was the navigational tool, right? And here's the thing. In the Bible, when you have light, it represents the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being present. For example, it's consistent of God going way back to Exodus. And in Exodus, it says that God led his people out of Egypt and through the wilderness with a cloud by day and a pillar of light, a pillar of fire by night to provide what? Light and to be a navigational tool so that they could find their way to where God wanted them to be. Hold on to that particular construction, that sentence. Is that God provides light, a navigational tool, so that we can get to where God wants us to be. And hopefully it's where we want to be. God provides light to help people travel safely to get to where God wants them to be. Now, we talk about the Bethlehem star or, or the, the, the Christmas star in December and so forth. And okay, you know, but let's understand something. It's not the North Star. The North Star, as I found out, because I'm always willing to do research for you people, I'm always willing to read things even if it makes my eyes glaze over, is that the North Star that we call the North Star is Polaris. And Polaris is not actually true north. It's not. You can look it up. It's in that area. And, you know, if you study the sky and this and that, it's geographic north, Polaris, what we call the North Star. Now, there's also magnetic north, right? And that's the North Pole that makes your uh, uh, magnet go or your compass uh, go up there and point to north. That's not true north. In fact, it changes because of the rotation of the earth. And so it's not even really true north, but it's as close as we're going to get. What I'm saying, when I talk about navigational tools and about what God provides for us, is, it, is that that thing that I want to place in your mind is, is that God has given us now and forever Jesus Christ and the ways of Jesus and the work of Jesus Okay, the work meaning his forgiveness and his, his grace and his death upon a cross so we can be forgiven of our sins, is that is the true north, and that is the true guiding star, if you will, is, is Jesus. And we're going to talk about this over the next couple of weeks. Jesus is different than Polaris. Jesus is different than the magnetic north pole. I'm saying that Jesus' ways and the work of Jesus, and the attitude, and, and, and what we can read about Jesus, like in the Gospel of Matthew, for example, these are the true North Star. These are the true firm uh, basis for direction in our lives. And again, I'm going to unpack that a little bit more, about having that sense of direction, as well as having something to orient and find our way. You know, I was thinking about that this last week, about I think it's pretty important in life to have a good sense of direction. That's a good life skill. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but there are probably some people in this room or over at Wesley listening in. It's good to see Wesley folks there, more and more people filling your pews. Um, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you probably really don't have a very good sense of direction? Anybody? Some of you probably. How many of you think you do have a good sense of direction? Huh? That's a good life skill to have, sense of direction. So like, like I could ask you to have a good sense of direction, just hold your hand up and your finger and point to where north is. Where's north in this room? Where's north if you, if you are brave enough? Okay, good, good, thank you. I came out and I've got a paper laid up here. I brought a compass out and laid it on the table so I could do this because I'm always willing to make sacrifices for my sermon, amen? North is right there, okay? Lay the compass on the table, drew it out. 
okay? North is that way, okay? I used a navigational tool to help me find that. Having a sense of direction is important. It's, it's funny. It's important to me because when I moved to Dubuque, Iowa, I grew up in southwest Iowa, south, south central Iowa, where everything's laid out on a nice orderly grid. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, on a north, south, east, west axis. So I came to Dubuque, and it's because it's a river town, it's like things aren't laid out on a nice orderly north, south, east, west axis. Y'all with me? Say yes. You know what I'm talking about? So, so like, like my house where I live, um, it, it bugged me. Like, I think that's west because it's all lined up. But I had to do the same thing. I laid a compass on the railing of my deck and took a Sharpie, and I drew where true north was. Just why? So I could orient myself, okay? And even though I've been in that house 12 years, I still painted a really elaborate compass on my deck. I should have taken a picture of that, Alec, and showed everybody, okay? But then somebody would have said something smart about the holes in my deck because I used to do my smoker on the deck. And there's a lesson. There's a fun fact Sunday. Don't do charcoal smokers on your deck. Coals drop through and burn your deck, okay? And so people have noticed that. But point is, point, it's a life skill. Having, having a sense of where you are, right? Having, have a sense so you can orient uh, yourself. You know, it's a, a funny story um, that I, I love telling this story. It's uh, the difference in generations is that, is that for many people, they've come to re- rely upon uh, Siri and turn-by-turn navigation. Is that you, anybody, to find your way around? Okay, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? But w- I was driving back from Des Moines with Alec, some months ago, and I didn't want to do Interstate 80 because Interstate 80 is like a racetrack and it's crazy. And so we were, I just went north of Colfax and said, Alec, I'm just going to take back roads. I'm going to pick a road here and go north. And I have a general sense of where Dubuque is. And when I come to a road that looks good, uh, that goes east, I'm going to turn east and go that way. And Alec is younger than I am, and it was just about killing him. He had his phone out. <laughs> you sure? Do you know where you are? No, I don't know where I am, but I know where I am, but I not specifically. And, and we'll keep going east, and if we run into a big river, we'll go left or right, and we'll come to Dubuque. And so um, that's a generational difference. Now, by the way, Alec got the last laugh. He was right because we got to a certain point, and I said, you know, I'm just pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, because I've been drinking coffee all morning, I'm pretty sure we'll come to a Casey's store in a little while, won't we? And he's going, let me find one for you. It's like, find one or else it's going to be a gravel road. Because anyway, I won't go any there. It's a generational difference, okay? It's a generational difference. Back on point is what I'm saying is okay. If you're traveling, if you're traveling, and if you want to get to your preferred destination, it's okay to use maps or to use the sun or to use the stars, or to use a compass, or to use Siri and turn-by-turn navigation that came with your car, or to use landmarks. It's all okay. It makes sense. It makes sense to get to your preferred destination. That next step for me was thinking about the barges that go up and down the Mississippi. You know, we... um, we live here in Dubuque, which has become uh, a great tourist destination. And sometimes we forget that because we live here every day. And, and I do. I forget sometimes um, the, the beautiful river out here and the barges that go up and down and how cool it is to stand at Eagle Point and look down on the lock and dam and watch barges go through. Anybody like doing that? Okay. I, I only do it when I have guests, when people come up to visit. But I got to thinking about this, about navigation and about the guy or the man or the woman that's driving the boat that's pushing the barges full of millions of dollars worth of stuff and about how they navigate. And so um, they have to have both north, south, east, west, sense of direction, compasses, GPS, whatever. But then I did a deep dive this week in finding out about buoys, right? Now, this is another one of those sacrifices I have made for you, dear congregation. And if you have trouble sleeping at night, I recommend going online, getting the Coast Guard Manual of Navigational Aids and read through that. Okay? I read through it as much as I could handle. I got this much and was like, holy cow, this is complex. Let me give you the basics. As I understand it, these barge captains, these boat captains, I'm going to use stick with the barges, is, is that they've got to know east, west, north, south. Yep, they've got to have all that. But they also have got to understand the buoy system. They've got to understand that these buoys are out there, and there's a whole bunch of different ones. I'm going to the simplest ones possible, red and green, port, starboard, front, back, right, um, all that. I don't really care to know. I don't want to own a boat. I've got a camper. That's enough. So, okay, um, th- they're there. 
And here's the important point. Why? They're there to navigate. They're there so that the boat driver, right, gets to where they need to go. And so east, west, north, south, but these buoys, what they do is keep that boat and that precious cargo in the main deep channel. They keep it in the main deep channel and away from the sandbars and away from rocks and away from shallow water so that they don't get stuck, okay? And so they follow these navigational aids. And again, I'm sure there's much, much more complexity to this, but for the point of a sermon, I'm not going there. You with me? Say yes, okay? Navigational tools, that's what they are. And I look at that and said, hmm, you know, a smart boat captain, a smart barge boat captain, I assume knows how to use these navigational tools. Would you agree with that? Say yes. They know how to use them. As opposed to, I mean, put it this way. If I had millions of dollars worth of cargo that's going to go in a barge up or down the Mississippi River, I want the boat captain that knows how to navigate using not just GPS, using a compass, but also knows how to read the buoy so he doesn't wreck, as opposed to the boat captain that says, eh, I'll just go with the flow. I'll just wing it. I'm sure I'll make it. New Orleans is straight south, right? I'm sure I'll be fine. I don't want that guy, and neither do you. Now, let's switch to you and to me. See, we have a choice to make about how to live our lives. We do. We have a choice about how to navigate through our everyday living. We have a choice about how we get to where we want to be, and more importantly, where God wants us to be. And that choice is we can go with the flow and just go with it and see where we end up, or we can use the navigational tools that God has given us to guide us, all right? This is true. And the truth is that all of us have some kind of standards. If you think about that for just a little bit, all of us, you all have some kind of standards. You have some kind of guidance that you're using right now, you know? There's something that guides you. You may not think about it every day. It may be subconscious, but every one of us has something that guides us. The challenge that I'm giving to you, because I've been challenging myself with it all week, the challenge I'm giving you is, one, to name it. To name first, what is your North Star? What is that giver of a sense of direction in your life? What is it? And two... What are the buoys or the lane markers? What are the lane markers uh, that you have in your life that you can look to, that you can check on, that you can see to make sure you're making progress and you're not crashing and burning on the shallow rocks, right? What are the buoys that you use to navigate? And we have choices. Again, we always have choices. Again, as you think about your life, as your person being that boat on the water navigating up river, you have choices, I ask you to name it, you know, in your, yourself, in your head, or maybe with the person that you live with, the person that you do life with. You know, what's your true north star? That sense that gives you a sense of direction. For some people, for example, if they were really honest with themselves, they would say, they would say to, in answer to that question, my true north star, the true thing that gives me a sense of direction is myself, right? I mean, that's what our culture has taught us. Our culture, our North American culture has taught us to say that, that hey, uh, do what you want when you want. Does it make you happy? Are you getting your way, right? Are you getting your way? Are you getting your preferences? That's your North Star. And that's what you use to guide yourself. That's how you, you look and say, well, I'm going to do, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And, and that's all the North Star that I need. And I've got some, some buoy, buoys. I've got some, some uh, things to check that I can look at to see if I'm making progress um, towards my happiness, like, and maybe your buoys are money or power or status or, or likes or pleasure or your job or your career or your leisure activity. Those are all things that we use like to say, okay, I'm staying between the lanes, but I'm saying that, is that it? What guides you? That's another way to ask the question about what is your North Star and what are your marker buoys? What are keeping you in the deep channel of going not just to where you want to be, but as a, somebody who proclaims to be a Christian, getting to where God wants you to be? Are you using the navigational tools to get there? 
Are you using the navigational tools that God has given you so that you can move through life both on the sunny, calm water days as well as on the dark and stormy nights? That's all I'm asking. What guides you? What's your north star? And what are some of the marker buoys of your life? What are some of the things not only that you would look to, but what are some of the things other people are looking to and seeing how you're living your life as buoys? So there's a lot of good positive buoys that, that can be those, those markers, right, that help guide us in the river of life. So, for example, um, for example, one of them is what I said to my grown nephews in being kind of a little bit of tough love with them uh, this summer and uh, just kind of did a check on those boys. They're in their 20s and 30s, and I said, guys, here's the deal. I don't know if anybody's ever told you this, but I'm going to tell you three things that you need to practice in your life to be men of character. Courtesy, generosity, and gratitude. You've got to practice those three things, boys. I love you, and that's why I'm telling you this, okay? And then they weren't quite sure what to say or think about that, but I told them anyway. Those are positive marker, boys. You understand what I'm saying? Say yes. Those are positive markers in your life or in somebody else's life that help keep you in a better, deeper channels. Just like we could point to, say, positive examples from our families or friends or positive traditions. Those are, those are good markers to have in our life, you know, as, as we make that journey and, and things that will keep us in the deep channel, that will keep us from trespassing, right? That will keep us from wrecking. And this is where I fold in the fruits of the Spirit, folks. This is where I fold in this list of things that we can check to see, are these things, are these marks of my life, right? And so you personalize it and you say, am I a loving person? Am I joyful? Am I joyful even if I'm not getting my way? Am I always at war and always in conflict or am I, am I, am I peaceful? Am I patient or am I impatient and demand what I want when I want it right now? All those things become marker boys is what I'm saying. And here's the other piece of cool good news. See, you don't just cherry pick one or two out of those and say, well, I really need to work on that patience one, so I'll try harder. Maybe I'll read a book about it. Nope. Circle back to what God taught us through Paul. He said this, and this is where the circle is complete. It's this idea that, A, if Jesus is your north star, and that's who you look to, the ways of Jesus, the attitude, the actions of Jesus, God in human flesh, the work of Jesus, if that's your true north star, and every single day you're working to follow that, you're working to follow, right? Then God says you will have placed yourself in a position for the Holy Spirit of God to do the work and to produce, to produce this. In other words, God will take care of that. It will happen. That's what the Holy Spirit does to form and transform. When you hear me use those words, that's what I'm talking about. Is that God even provided this way for, for us to begin changing into the image of Jesus Christ? But again, North Star. Jesus has got to be your North Star, not yourself. Not something else. It's got to be the ways and the work of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will produce these fruits. And I go back to that where we started. Is that God desires that we follow Jesus. God desires that we grow daily to look more like and talk more like and think more like and act more like Jesus Christ, God in human flesh. This is what God wants. This is what God desires. And God has provided a main deep channel, a way, a way for us to move towards this destination. God has provided the true North Star that is Jesus and God has provided this as a way to orient our lives and, and to help us, to help us check to see how we're doing. He's given us those marker buoys and to help us navigate. So when you consider where you want to be in the next four months, when you consider where you want to be, your destination starting tomorrow, and where you end up January 1st, 2022, be mindful of what I've challenge you with today of what first what God wants and what, where God wants you to be. And secondly, that it isn't just thrown out there. Is that It's always consistently true that God says, I will not leave you as orphans. If God calls us to do something, if God calls us to be something, God will provide the way and the truth and the life to get there. So I give that to 
all of us. And I want to pray for all of us right now. Let's be in that attitude. Lord God, I pray for those that are in this room and those that are at the Wesley worship space. I pray for us today. I pray for those that are seeking and trying to find some direction. I pray, Lord, that you now take any and all words that I've spoken and, Lord, use them to speak to your people, especially those most in need. I pray, Lord God, that you now produce fruit in the heads and in the hearts of those who have heard this message. I pray that you produce fruit and that people feel it and that they know it. I pray all of this in Jesus' name for all of us. And all of us pray together out loud and in one voice the prayer Jesus taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.